Okay, so welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, thank you so much for joining this evening for second online webinar of the Ngara Institute. It is the second webinar that we organized related to our climate series 2020, in which we ask, how then shall we live? So my name is Jean Renouf, and I'm the deputy chair of the Ngara Management Committee. And of course, I'm your host for this evening. I'm also a lecturer at Southern Cross University, and I'm the founder of Resilient Byron, which is a non-for-profit that aims to build the resilience and regenerative capacities of the people of the Byron Shire and surrounds. So while I speak, I'm also receiving text messages from my colleagues at Ngara, and I know we are trying to get all on board. So I need to check these. I thank you again for your patience. Um, Once uh, Tim and I start chatting, you might be able to go back to your buttons. Yes, absolutely. All is not lost. They will always, <laughs> they're always away. <laughs> that, that's the spirit for tonight's conversation. Absolutely, baby. Adapt or die. Exactly. Uh, that sounds like we're framing the conversation already. <laughs> that's a bit dramatic, though. It was a provocation <laughs> only. You love your provocations, Tim. <laughs> So well, we've got to have them, or how else do we respond to this current situation? Mm, right. We shall explore this. We shall explore this. So welcome, everyone, again. On behalf of the Gara Institute, we would like to thank you very much uh, for those of you who support and have been supporting us for many years now. We are extremely grateful for your generosity and, and engagement with us. And we also welcome any newcomers to the Gara Institute events. You're very welcome today. I'd like also to thank all of the Nagara staff and volunteers who work so hard behind the scene to ensure that we can have those meaningful conversations. And before I introduce tonight's guests, Dr. Michel Maloney and Tim Katzman, I would like also to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which the Nagara Institute is located, in particular the Arakwal people of the Banjalami Nation, and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. And also, we urge you to read, if you haven't done already, the Uluru Statement, and to support in whatever way you can the voice and empowerment of Indigenous people. I'd like also to take this opportunity to offer a very special welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us tonight. So tonight we're talking about the future, what sort of future we're looking at, and how can we as citizens move into this future in the, in, in the most smooth way possible. So you would be acutely aware that we are in the middle of multiple crises, environmental, political, social, economic, and financial. We have in the past six months been experiencing in Australia, droughts, bushfires, floods, a pandemic, an ongoing economic crisis, and I'm sure I'm missing a couple. The climate change projections for the coming years and decades are quite dire. And add in all of this, the biodiversity crisis, the plastic pollution, the increasing economic inequalities, the epidemic of loneliness, and there's no, no doubt that we are in for a rocky ride. So at, the, at Nagara, we recognize that these crises are part and parcel of a system, neoliberalism, that remains dependent on highly destructive fossil fuel industries. And as the sixth extinction is well underway, there has never been a more important time to create the deliberative space for intelligent conversation about the real implications of those crises and what we citizens can do about it. So tonight, we explore how we can communicate about and make the necessary societal transition to survive this charged future, perhaps through law, economics, politics, ethics, education, and the arts. So with this brief introduction, I would like now to introduce our two panelists. I'm personally very excited by the conversation. Uh, Dr. Michel Maloney, Dr. Tim Kahneman, and I have had the privilege to already have a chat last week and again uh, today. And I'm, I'm very, very much looking forward to the conversation we're gonna have tonight. So Dr. Michel Maloney is a co-founder and national convener at the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, AELA. She's also an adjunct senior fellow at Griffiths University Laws Futures Centre, and she's the director of the New Economic Network Australia and of Future Dreaming Australia. She advocates for systems change 
in order to shift industrialized societies from a human-centered to an earth-centered governance system. So Michel, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, as I said, I'm really happy to have you on board with us. I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about your views. I think you have a lot to offer. And thank you for having me. <laughs> with great pleasure. So perhaps to kick off the conversation, I'd like to acknowledge the situation we are all in at the moment and probably a good part of our mental headspace is you know, allocated uh, to the current COVID-19 and economic crisis. So perhaps the first question I'd like to ask you is, what can we learn from this crisis in terms of preparing for future crisis? And how can these lessons help guide our response to the climate emergency? Thank you. I think that's a fascinating question. And I'm sure, well, I, I assume many people on this call are either in, fully engaged in that kind of discussion and exploring what does all of this mean for, for where we're going and what, what can we learn or where can we go from here? Um, certainly the work I do within AILA, the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, we're particularly, we've been working for many years on systems change. What does that mean? It means looking at the underpinning structures of industrialised society um, and not just since sort of the, the escalation of neoliberalism, particularly since the 80s, but if we look from an Earth-centred point of view, and a lot of the work we're inspired by is Earth jurisprudence and First Nations people's traditional knowledge and wisdom, really a lot of the ideas that we um, are burdened with in modern society um, have emerged through European expansionism in the colonial and imperialist, uh, imperialism phases from the 15, 1600s, this idea of endless expansionism, this idea that we can continue to keep going to the next thing. When we run out of something in one place, we can go and invade somewhere else and get more stuff. Um, I think from our point of view within AILA, what we're particularly interested in, what we've been working towards is trying to help people understand our place in the world um, as one of many, many members of a living earth community. And I don't want to sound like I'm a complete sort of tree hugging hippie, although I am, let's be honest, I'm a lawyer and a hippie. Um, but what I have found through the COVID process, the, the situation we've all found ourselves in is many of us who've been thinking about systems change are watching what's happening to sort of, I guess, the general economic discussions and the debates. And it feels like there's been an escalation of progressive thinking about systems broken, uh, the economics, the politics, the power, the structures that have been put in place that are causing ecological devastation, that are, calling, are causing inequality amongst ordinary human beings, um, have ground to a halt in many places. And it has offered a fascinating insight into many of the systems changes that folks have been arguing for for decades, whether slowing down and shifting from fossil fuels, whether arguing for degrowth, uh, localization, less international travel, more local food production, people staying at home and, and supporting each other and, and connecting with community. So for someone like me, um, despite I've been terribly um, saddened by obviously the, the terrible plight of so many people, particularly not in Australia, in other places who've been struck down and, and illnesses in communities and, and terrible conditions, particularly for the poorer sectors of our society. But at the same time as someone who's been very much interested in how our industrialized systems and by industrialized, I'm sure most of you know, but what we mean is a tremendous large scale of stuff. Uh, local farming is where small farms or small groups of people do something. Um, industrialized scale means that you might look across hundreds of thousands of acres or hectares and it's like mm -hmm. a culture or a mono something. And we're just using phenomenal extractive power since developed, um, particularly after the Second World War, to um, really escalate how much we take from uh, soil, trees, forests, biodiversity, and also how much waste we produce and pump back in. So industrialization as such um, normally means human beings kind of coming out of balance with the day to day and really being able to quite frankly suck the very life out of the earth system. Mm. To wrap up on my answer, I think from, from my own personal point of view, I'm sure everyone has a different take on it, but what COVID has shown us is there is an alternative to the kinds of lifestyles, the kinds of systems, many of the things that so many folks have been working against or to change for decades has really come to, to pass and to show people that we can exist 
without international air travel or as much international air travel. Um, the people that matter in a society are not the wealthiest, but those who care for each other. Um, we've seen remarkable stories of rejuvenation of waterways and living systems and beautiful little videos, some of which I question, but showing animals returning to places, um, species that haven't been seen in certain places. Um, you know, there's a real sense of, wow, look at this different way that we could exist. For me personally, despite the devastation and the sadness um, from the pandemic, it has come at a time when I think many people, many people needed to be reminded that there are other ways to live and that we can create change together. And despite a very bleak future due to some of the predictions we see for climate change, there's an awful lot of phenomenal and quick change we can make together. And that's been evidenced by some of the responses to the pandemic. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. You've brought in already many aspects we could be discussing all night. Um, <laughs> all week or an entire lifetime, yes. Let's, let's have that conversation. Um, what I hear here really is actually like recognizing the, the crisis and the gravity of the situation and, and the underlying dynamics that they come from. So despite this, you still have a note of optimism because this crisis and the response to this crisis has shown that we can actually stick together and we can change the way we have lived so far. Absolutely. Hmm, that's very inspiring. Thank you. So Dr. Tim Cadman is an academic, a science fiction writer and public intellectual with an interest in governance, sustainability, climate change, natural resources management and responsible investment. He's currently deeply involved in working to protect the headwaters of the Kalang River near Belingen from logging. His commitments include being a research fellow at Griffith University's Institute for Ethics, Governance and Law, and adjunct research fellow at the University of Southern, Southern Queensland. Dr. Kazman, three book series, The Changes, which book cover you can see in front of the screen. And I'm also uh, happy to say that the third of the three book series will be publicly released this Saturday. This book series is a respected and well-reviewed contribution to the emergence, emerging cli -fi, climate fiction genre. It is available for order from, from most online book retailers and electronic formats. What would our future look like if we do not change, if we continue business as usual? All right, well, thank you, Jean. And also I uh, acknowledge that I am on uh, Gumbangi country uh, and I pay respect to the elders uh, past, present and future. Um, one of the good things about being able to have a flight of fancy in a, um, a fictional context is that I don't have to be bothered by all the footnotes and references and uh, all that claptrap um, that comes with writing um, boring and turgid academic papers. And I can basically distill into an action-packed uh, thriller and romance uh, all the kinds of things that um, I think are going to happen. And essentially, I'm sure we'll talk as the, uh, as the evening goes on about the, the notion of sustainability. And as Michelle's already indicated, the kind of alternative futures that, that we can uh, envisage. Uh, you talked about five aspects of how we might look at uh, the current world uh, philosophy, but essentially you can break it down into environmental, economic and social. And if we uh, forward cast where we're headed um, in those three uh, modes, if you like, this is my take. So you already talked about the biodiversity crisis. What people don't really understand is that the climate crisis is actually a biodiversity crisis. And it's not just that the sun is shining too much and it's getting hot and critters are dying uh, in bushfires. It's also that because we have so mistreated the earth and so affected the natural web of life that sustains our food systems, our uh, water systems, our, our air systems, is that um, climate change is actually being exacerbated by a lack of biodiversity. So one of the problems with the bushfires that we experienced in, this, uh, in these past few months is the fact that our soils are so impoverished that there's no bacteria and there's no mycorrhizae there that are actually 
capable of functioning as an ecosystem. So they are just completely dry. So of course the first spark that comes along, off they go. Now, surprise, surprise, uh, the Shire of Bellingen is surrounded by national parks and world heritage areas. And we did not burn. And we did not burn because we have intact native forest all around us. So one of the issues that we need to really uh, recognize with climate change, and if we push it forward, in fact, we don't really need to push it forward. We're seeing its impacts now. We've lost 60% of the Gondwana rainforests of this continent in the last few months. These are uh, rainforests that have been evolving for the last 120 million years. And in the space of a few months, we have lost over half of them. These are um, forest communities that will never return. Our koala population here in New South Wales has been completely decimated. Uh, and yet we are in an economic system that, um, to bring us back to your discussion about neoliberalism, is actually making a profit right now from the fact that people are panicking and buying toilet paper. And a whole series of new logging compartments in my shire have been opened up simply to supply the pulp and paper industry and to pro provide telegraph poles uh, for, to replace those that were burnt down in the fires because in New South Wales, rather than use pylons that last forever, we'd much rather go into pristine rainforest and, and, and take the trees out. So to a certain extent, I'm talking about the present, but we are already living the future. But if we look from a societal level, again, kind of echoing Michelle, um, is what we are seeing um, with what's happening in society already in the US, for example. I was just talking to one of my friends uh, last night who lives in, in a small town. The town is completely divided between those people who believe in climate change and a consequent, um, sorry, look, what a Freudian mistake. Um, already believe that COVID-19 is real um, and are consequently wearing masks. They go into a, um, a shop where um, that sector of the town does not believe in climate change, oh sorry, uh, COVID-19, uh, and they're hounded out of the shops and vice versa. And we are seeing in the United States, essentially, I see the collapse of the nation state system. And this is what we can expect with climate change. We can expect a collapse of the conventional economic system uh, and a collapse of the, the world order as we have understood it since the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. The nation states will no longer really be able to be in control because they will be at the mercy of um, climate change. And very importantly, they will be at the mercy of mass force migration of people. So the only game in town will be managing the hundreds of millions of people that are moving around the planet that need to be fed uh, and sheltered and not turn in on each other. So a bit like the COVID-19, which we've seen an intimation of, we've seen um, the kind of neoliberal um, insanity um, kind of take a bit of a rain check because actually when there is no functioning economy, you can't have ideology. You actually have to look at the crisis that's in front of you uh, and, and, and you have to adapt. Uh, so really all I do in my world, um, my, my future world is, is push us or nudge us uh, 50 to 80 years into the future and then, then play out the whole of climate change because I have to um, relay some distressing information uh, right now, and that is that there is no cure for climate change. The decisions from a policy perspective that should have been made should have been made somewhere between 1975 and 1980 in order to stop the unstoppable um, concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The issue for us now 
is do we have the um, levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that will increase the temperature uh, of the planet to where we're actually headed now from counting the particles and doing the maths you know i'm i'm a political scientist i'm i'm not a uh, a number cruncher uh, but i do understand the empirical method and i do know that when my colleagues tell me that the paris agreement under the framework convention on climate change says two degrees preferably 1.5 or we're all doomed uh but actually we're headed to between 3.5 degrees and 3.7 degrees, um, I'm extremely worried because the number of parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today, if we don't do anything about them, within five to seven years, there will be too much for us to do stuff about and we will go over two degrees centigrade and the planet will fry um, and, uh, billions of us will die um, and so uh, how do you live with that and how do you live with the fact that that impact will last for 100,000 years because that's how long it will take for the planet to restabilize because of course we are uh, we are a, we are a little planet in the universe uh, in a galaxy in the universe and eventually everything will get back to homeostasis and uh, and, and settle down again uh, but we are condemning the future uh, 100,000 years to whatever it is we do or do not do now. Uh, and so really in my, uh, in my novel, I take everything that I see in the climate negotiations and go, well, right, well, this is what will happen if we don't plant trees or, you know, whatever it is. How can we avert that future? What can we do to avert that future? But to complexify a bit the, uh, the question, I'd like to add to this a question, question put forth by Fiona Brooks. And Fiona, I, I sincerely thank you for your really good question. Most of us humans seem wired to be slow and resistant to recognizing when changes in our environment require changes in our behavior. What does that imply for our ability to address our many existential threats in time? What do you think we could do about it? Michelle, the floor is yours. Well, you know, I'm always very humble in my answers because I am one human being with one little brain. I'm sure there's lots of folks out there who could perhaps answer equally as well. But um, how can we avert the future? I think I agree with Tim that a lot of the future has been written in the last 30 years by many governments in industrialized countries, the big emitters, not taking the action that we needed to take. However, I am an apocalyptimist. Uh, I know that things are turning into hell in a handbasket, but I also have this, I don't know if it's a flaw in my personality type, but I also have an optimism that we will be able to do something good in, a mean, in a, amidst the things that are happening. And I think some of that's going to be dependent on the place that you live, uh, the luck or lack of luck um, from the communities you live in. And I think, again, COVID has shown us some communities um, have banded together supported each other, shown phenomenal resilience and support for each other, while others, and some of them are communities, I'm thinking of particularly in the US, but others where they have sort of imploded. So there is no absolutism. There is no, no kind of answer for all of humanity. I think Mother Earth is telling us in no uncertain terms that since the Industrial Revolution, we've simply been pumping too much of the bad stuff out of the Earth and into the atmosphere. We've created a, the greenhouse effect. We've been pumping more stuff in. We're warming up the planet. We still have time to act. We still have time to make some of the changes necessary, as Tim said, to keep us within a realm of livability within the parameters of change. That's what I focus on. I literally wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning if all I thought about was my grandkids are gonna fry to death when they walk out into the So I can't think that way. So first of all, the work I've been doing for, I'm 50 this year, so I've been working for 30 years on a ma all manner of climate change projects since the early 90s. I've watched the corporate misinformation strategies. I was lucky enough to work, and I actually think one of my colleagues is on this call, um, Zoom call. Felicity, if you're there, hello, darling. We were part of the Sustainable Energy Development Authority back in the mid 90s, which had pretty much sorted out how we develop programs to respond to um, and to reduce um, carbon emissions in Australia. We were working on climate change before climate change adaptation became a thing. Mm. I have watched in my lifetime 
opportunities keep passing us by as governments, plutocracies will not take the action that affects the powerful, that affects the corporate interests. But that said, the things we can do to make the world a little safer and certainly to ensure motivation, inspiration and action over the coming years, decades are already happening. Like the problems that have brought us to where we are, the solutions have also been emerging. So just to remember, from the moment the industrial revolution in Europe started to catch on, there were people challenging that. The Luddites didn't like the machines. People challenged the fact that technology was replacing humans. Um, cooperatives, mutual societies, mutual aid, um, a whole bunch of things today we would frame as well-being economy, new economy, cooperatives or community development actually emerged um, as a direct response to industrial uh, processes being introduced and changing communities from being small, bespoke, homemade, to coming into factories, to producing stuff, to becoming fodder for the capitalist project. There's been a wonderful history throughout the 20th century that has escalated over the last two decades, three decades, of people working on social enterprises, social solidarity, collaborat collaboration, sharing economies. Um, the last few years, we've seen the rise in framing around the well-being economy. Governments like New Zealand, Iceland, Scotland, other places are trying to think about how you ditch GDP, how you ditch the old economy measures and you do something different. I find huge encouragement in the scaling up of some of those ideas, but particularly, and I guess I can refer to the work I do within the New Economy Network Australia or NINA, where we're seeing thousands and thousands of people who are already and have been for a long time building beautiful local food systems, community gardens, tool libraries, all kinds of um, mechanisms to help improve health and family and sharing and support. And again, COVID has shown us, at least in the Australian context, in most communities, people, the first thing people wanted to do, I was overwhelmed with all the people sending me notes about, put this in your neighbor's mailbox, tell them that you're there to help them if you want to. And I remember just thinking that that simple act was remarkable and beautiful because people were going, oh my God, what's happening and how can I help? It wasn't, I mean, yes, we all went mad and bought toilet paper and I forgive us for that. I don't understand it, but you know, it's a stupid, weird thing. Everyone has a stupid, weird thing. I talked to a lot of friends in the US through the rights of nature movement. They have bigger problems because when we were running out of toilet paper, they were running out of guns in their gun shops. So all my non-gun friends were hiding in their homes going, what the heck? And we're seeing some of that play out. So again, just to wrap up quickly, I'll come back to the second question by Fiona, but how can we prepare ourselves or continue to keep doing the good work for the future? I think in a lot of ways, we need to speed up all of the good stuff. We need to amplify and connect the amazing ideas, whether it's shifting from fossil fuels, supporting in a compassionate way, uh, communities that do need to transition to different ways of making a living and making a life. Um, we saw it very much in the last Queensland election where the government wasn't talking in terms of how can we support communities to transition to um, conditions and economic situations that are good for them and good for the planet. It wasn't that, it was more mining, more extractivism. And you were either for that or you were against that. So there is a whole range of excellent um, ideas, and practical examples and policy structures and governments. There's only a few of them. And may I add that many of them are driven by women, but anyway, won't go there. Um, there's already a ton of great stuff we can do and we need to hurry it up, join up the dots. And I'm certainly seeing a huge amount of traction and an escalation in people thinking and worrying about how do we get the systems change sped up? How do we respond to this COVID? How do we take all the ideas we've been plotting away at up against corporate control of resource extraction and make things happen. Some of the problems are still there, but I do think there's a greater commitment by perhaps more people to mm -hmm. make change. Why are human beings so um, reluctant to make the change we need? I'm not a psychologist, but in my work on climate change issues and behavior change, and many other projects I've been privileged to work with lovely people who've done a lot of amazing research to understand literally the neurons and the human brain and why we do the things we do. I actually think Ross Garneau um, years ago in his um, report on climate change at best um, where human beings aren't very good at dealing with wicked complex problems. Biologically speaking, the whole fight flight 
possibility of, I am frightened by this mammoth, I will run away, um, or I will stay and fight this opponent. It's a simplistic story, but this is the story we've been told, that human beings have, have difficulty envisioning a future, envisioning um, threats that may be very real, but at the same time feel very distant. But I think we can move past that now. I think the biggest problem we have is corporate misinformation. And that's what I'll just come back to. When we were working in the 90s on climate change, I personally saw the early days of people going, huh, what's climate change? Oh, well, what can we do about it? And we were actually engaging with businesses who were, they'd never heard of it, but they were interested, they were willing. And within just a few years, we saw what um, that wonderful book, Merchants of Doubt, by Naomi Oreskes talks about the complete misinformation campaign by people similar to those who created confusion around the true impacts of tobacco started to create, and it had the legacy today is profound. I think you see the legacy of the misinformation campaign and the, the building of distrust of science. You're seeing that played out in those people, in those communities, in the US and other places where with a mask, without a mask, with a gun, without a gun, I don't believe in this virus. I mean, how medieval do we need to be? I think, we cannot underplay, I'll finish up with, we cannot underplay or understate how profoundly creative human beings can be when they want to. We're often very good in a crisis. If we can accept that something's a crisis, we do get in and get things done. Um, but we cannot underplay the power of corporates. And in this country, that includes the Murdoch press and anybody who's trying to um, position themselves to ensure mineral companies or other companies continue to control the Australian policy agenda. Um, we can talk and act and do whatever we want, but unless we also join forces and challenge the power structures, um, we're not going to make the kind of collective action as quickly as we need. So how can progressives best challenge what is currently happening and move us towards the future we desire? Oh, well, look, I mean, um, yes, that's a, that's a very cogent analysis, Alison. And I mean, I've already alluded to the rise of, um, you know, this sp specific expression of disaster capitalism that we're seeing now, particularly in forestry, for example. So all uh, most tropical timber uh, imports have, have collapsed in places like Indonesia. In fact, Indonesia uh, two weeks ago opened all export restrictions on, on its timber, having uh, having had a ban for 30 years because of the loss of orangutan habitat, etc. Um, but we're watching the industry here just sharpen its knives um, and under cover of night and day, 24 seven, um, with uh, lights on in paddocks, um, the machines are um, raping uh, all this burnt forest. And they're driving over um, this land that is so parchment fragile because of the forest and taking the timber and sending it down to the Eden Woodchip Mill, uh, where it is now being exported as salvage to feed the biomass energy green power plants um, of Asia. Um, so yes, um, absolutely. Um, every disaster uh, is an opportunity. And, you know, you only have to look at uh, at Donald Trump's uh, family history to see that he's just the last in a long line of uh, carpetbaggers. Uh, so yes, that is the, that is the dark analysis. Um, but um, I'm, uh, despite everything, also uh, an optimist that I like to call myself a, a, a pracademic. So of course, um, I've been getting quite cranky with people going, oh, there's nothing to do. I'm stuck at home. It's all so depressing. Uh, so I've been going, well, bugger this attack on our democracy. Bugger the fact that I can't go out and express my views. Uh, I'm going to put on my silly little koala head and shout, save Kalang uh, outside my front gate every day for four months until I get 2,500 likes every time I do a crappy video. Um, so people can all, uh, in whatever form, uh, take action. Um, and then I suppose the third thing is, is um, you know, again, I wanted to jump in uh, to Michelle's comments and say, uh, you know, look, um, it all depends on leadership. And it's such a trite phrase, but um, some people do not do well in a crisis. 
That's true. Uh, Donald Trump has stuck his head in the sand and is playing golf because he's totally freaked out. Isn't he drinking um, bleach? I don't think he's playing yeah. golf. Anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, so, but um, surprisingly, um, old ScoMo's kind of managed to dust off his... Uh, his sort of actual liberal values, as opposed to being in a liberal party that's not actually recognised by the Federation of, uh, of Liberal Parties worldwide as a liberal party, uh, but is a, a, actually a conservative party. But we are seeing the necessary response to the fact that the shit, excuse the French, um, has hit the fan uh, and we've got to do something. Um, and perhaps there's a little bit of hope there the only problem is, is that people get very stuck with this economic model that we have because they actually think it's the only game in town. But as um, Michelle has, has indicated, uh, profit maximization and cost externalization in a finite planet is not actually logical. And the world came together uh, in the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 and worked that out and came up with the, with the idea of sustainable development. And Michelle's is absolutely right, is that people and uh, businesses, um, all shape and form, social enterprises, just, you know, uh, a current manifestation, the collaborative economy, the share economy, et cetera, et cetera, is people know um, that uh, quantity is never as good as quality. Uh, and if you have a quality based system, a system that has values uh, and that values things, not for the lowness of the price, but their durability, um, then, you know, we're in a better space. The worst thing we could do uh, when we come out of this crisis is do exactly what uh, Gladys Berejiklian has just announced here in New South Wales today. She's put a wage freeze on all the public sector for the next 12 months, which will actually really badly impact on their economy, um, their single bottom line economy, but it will, it, you know, it will, it will affect all of us. So um, we really do need leaders that are prepared to get out of the, the ideological trenches. And that sadly being the, the realist again in my kind of putting my cli-fi uh, hat back on is uh, seems to be default mode because climate change is what's called uh, slow violence. People respond. But, Tim, can I just can I jump in there? I think absolutely the right leadership at the right time can be hugely beneficial. Number one, I'd challenge the fact that Scomo's leadership was the right leadership at the right time. I think he did a number of actions that were a good response to an anthropocentric crisis or an ant a human focused problem. But he pressed pause on parliamentary democracy. He brought in a, a very small committee of big business people. And, you know, it's now convenient to listen to scientists, whereas during climate change or any arguments by anybody about restructuring an economy to support human beings, not interested. So there's his own benefit, his own... I'm not hugely impressed with what he did, although I do think we did a lot better than many other countries, for sure. But I also would challenge the notion of only a certain kind of leadership model because when you look at and i'm sure others on this call could speak better to this than myself um things like the uptake by ordinary communities around renewable energy that the genuine passion people have to do their very best to shift from fossil fuels in in light of the fact that government and structures are not going to do that for us they're one of many many examples of grassroots folks really coming together to do as much as they can too and I often say as a lawyer that some of the best action we can possibly take as a collective, as, as a society, is through the collection of taxes, the, the so-called election of democratic representatives. But we live in a time when in Australia, um, no disrespect to old white men, but a lot of the old white men who control the government systems um, and the old white women um, are not doing what we need to do to rethink um, the whole system. And I think ScoMo's response was definitely better than Trump, but my daughter's response as a 12 year old was better than Trump, you know? Um, so anyway, I didn't want to interrupt too much, but I do, I question the true motives of our federal government in some of its actions. It's very easy to 
shut certain sectors down in society whilst allowing environmental rape and destruction while continuing to support mining and extraction. And then it, it's easier to respond to a human crisis than an ecological crisis, I think, for them. You know, I mean, I don't want to um, be um, Scott Morrison's uh, advocate on this platform tonight. But again, I mean, I think we have to we have to recognise the lack of quality of global leadership worldwide. Even some of those women you uh, refer to uh, in some of the more progressive countries in in Europe are uh, Belgium and Sweden, for example, are engaging oh, yeah. in some absolutely terrible um, social experiments. Um, we we have to look at the fact. Yes, we are lucky that we are an island. Uh, and we've only had to date, as far as I know, I think 102 deaths. Uh, but Britain is also an island and they're up to 39,000 now. So mm. this is the quality of the leadership uh, that we are uh, confronting now. And essentially, um, we have this problem uh, in late uh, capitalism that uh, we don't really have any kind of idea or stimulus or energy or alternative thinking because there's no communism. There's no external threat that these um, leaders can actually see. Well, they feel climate change as a kind of uh, existential threat. So in a sense, we have to uh, look at uh, the good that we do see uh, in our country, for example, with the fact that we did manage to um, put in place a universal basic income. But then, of course, as you say, we get towards the end of the crisis and suddenly the 70 billion that was going to be allocated has been cut by half. Uh, Three million artists, uh, social scientists, you know, useless people are, are no longer going to um, uh, benefit from it. And Gladys is sharpening the knives again. So I'm a little bit negative that I'm not sure we will learn the lessons from this, but had we not had it, I think we possibly may have had much less chance than we now may have. Karen Jones has mentioned it was not a universal basic income. Many people missed out. I would agree with that. As someone who spends a lot of time doing small contract work and tons of volunteering, I was not eligible. A true universal basic income or livable basic wage or wage guarantee would ensure that every, every adult or every human in, in a society has a capacity to feed themselves while pursuing other opportunities. Awesome. Um, hmm. I'll answer your question, Fiona, about UBI. The New Economy Network Australia has a UBI hub. Um, just jump on our website. I'll type that in now. It's, there are some amazing people around Australia connected into that. So, N Michelle, perhaps like cutting further the conversation, and we've talked a lot about you know, the breaks to changes, but AILA, I understand, is all about system change, so quite ambitious. So even despite the economic breaks or challenges, despite the um, leadership challenges, how do we move on then? How do we, as, uh, as a society, as a complex, multifaceted society, which is interconnected globally, how do we affect change rapidly in a way which allows us to avert the worst? And linked with this, I'd like to add a question from Andrew Buckwell here. Uh, and for all the attendees, you, you probably see the question coming up on your own screen and there's a little like button. You can press on this button if you would like us to ask those questions rather than others. So thank you, Andrew, for your question. So I'm reading it out loud. Our, upset, our obsession for, with GDP is well documented and widely critiqued as a measure of what adds value to our lives. But Piketty, the, the famous French economist, showed that low growth in output is historically associated with increases in inequality. So, Michel, I know you're not necessarily an economist, but... No, but I can respond with some to that question yes, after... He's asking, how do we start tackling the second problem so we can tackle the first? Yeah, yeah. sure. So, thank you, um, Jean, and thank you, Andrew. Um, I can certainly come back to that question about GDP. Um, I'm not an economist, but within the New Economy Network and some of the Earth-centred or ecological economic stuff we look at, it's, we contemplate this on a, on a regular basis. But, look, firstly, um, how do we make the change we need to make? I think for many people already involved in progressive activities, thinking, writing, working, doing, keep going, just keep doing what you're doing. I think sometimes people are always looking for that silver bullet, the thing that will suddenly escalate or accelerate what we're doing. I would love to find that too. To me, there are two simple responses. If we had 
government interest in making the kinds of radical change that we need to respond to climate change, we could respond much more quickly. And by that, I'm not, I'm not one of those people that just sort of puts my hand out and thinks government should solve problems. But at its most philosophical level, a democratic government particularly, and one that is funded by raising taxes from its community, is by very definition the representation of collective action. It's meant to be the space where millions of people elect representatives or share um, funding into a common pool to make something happen. Um, and we saw the, the litany of prime ministers disappear down the gurgler as they tried to address the carbon price, as they tried to think about a carbon tax. Um, we are now living in a time when our governments are not taking fast, responsible action to address the climate change future we're already in, as Tim said, and that we're about to roll out into. However, I still think there is a phenomenal amount of opportunity and uh, um, potential within ordinary people, whether you're an academic, a social enterprise uh, manager, someone who runs an NGO, someone who volunteers into many, many causes and activities, the sheer volume of the thousands and millions of people across Australia who are already engaged in all of the organisations doing great stuff connected to the New Economy Network, all of the organisations working so hard to protect the environment, people like Tim riding, hanging out of his tree, dressed as a koala versus Environmental Defenders Office, ACF, WWF, a lot of these groups, everybody that I know um, who is already working towards good action and good change um, should definitely be optimistic and continue that and continue to look for better ways to challenge the power structures. Um, we do have an odd relationship in Australia with our politicians. We all want a different system, but many progressives I know won't jump in behind the Greens for whatever reason. They won't jump in behind independence for whatever reason. Um, on the one hand, the reluctance we have towards supporting pol political processes is healthy and cynical. But on the flip side, that is an area that I think some Australians might want to rethink how we continue to form collective action. So there's so much we can do by ourselves, but we must be thinking about the structural reform and even the generation of cool ideas, interesting ideas. Like the folks who've been working on UBI and other issues, it's brilliant. And then they're ready to sort of push forward to people. This is the way to do it. Uh, Tim Hollow at the Green Institute and a whole bunch of other people, I think I signed off, I hope I did, on a constructive letter to government about how to properly structure a living wage. So all of the good ideas people develop need to continue to be joined up. Within our work within AILA, we're really interested in practical ways that communities can rethink their relationship with um, the destruction of the living world. And I don't have time to go into it, but we've designed a, a little step-by-step -step process that's quite um, quite a nice way to bring together all of the good stuff, to think about the steps we need to take to understand ecological limits. That's something that's completely absent from policy uh, discourse in Australia. And I'll come back to the GDP thing because of that. But we've been doing work and we've got a couple of pilot projects that is actually linking in a ton of good work from other people to help show um, whether you're looking at donor economics, steady state economics, or even some aspects of um, ecological economics and looking at ecological health and looking at the new economy. There's all these fantastic ideas and we're working on a very pragmatic, practical way to uh, implement that in, by a regional sense in a little program called Green Prints. Back to GDP. Um, JFK is famous for acknowledging GDP doesn't matter what, doesn't measure what matters. Um, some of the economists who started out designing GDP critiqued it themselves. It's been locked onto by um, the sort of so-called industrialized slash first world slash corporate leaders um, because it meets their interests. It narrowly defines what an economy is. It narrowly defines what growth and success looks like. Um, I personally think one of the best antidotes to that at the moment is the well-being um, economy and the well-being budget movement. Um, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, some of the folks in Scotland, even the city of Amsterdam, which is actually grappling with well-being economy, but inside a donut economics framework, which is been, has been a handy 21st century way to link to planetary boundaries and ecological limits. There are very sound ways to replace GDP. And I'm sure there's people in this call thinking, what about the 
Bhutan's um, index, happiness index, and there's all these other measures. And there's a cool group in Australia, Andy, the Australian National Development Index. So there are ways to challenge that. The biggest trick, like most of these great ideas, is how do we get it into public policy? And how do we get it into government? Um, again, there's a mix of different theories of change. One of those theories of change is let's start demonstrating how it, how it could work. We do that in a lot of different ways already. And how do we keep pushing for the change we want? And a little plug for Nina, within the New Economy Network Australia, we're engaged in a process at the moment where we're inviting all of our members and anyone across our network of thousands of people to input their ideas to what we're calling Australia's first national civil society strategy for a new economy. And that is literally doing the, the hard yards of listening to all the work that everyone's already doing and stitching it together to say, if we're looking across disciplines, if we're looking across sectors, if we're looking at systems change and all these different bits and bots, Australians are often a little bit reluctant to acknowledge their own awesomeness. And there are some phenomenal thinkers and doers in this country. And um, I personally am thrilled to be working in a space where we're harvesting those groovy ideas and bringing them together in a way that we can show other people. Like, hey, here is a whole bunch of cool ideas. Every, half of them are road tested. All you need to do is whack your politicians over the head and elect better politicians and do your civil society work. So mm. we have a multiplicity of problems. We need a multiplicity of approaches and solutions. There is no single way to do this. We all need to throw our good stuff in. <laughs> no, that, that makes a lot of sense, I think. And, and also uh, clarifies the fact that, as you mentioned before, it's not a silver bullet solution. We need to explore several solutions, some of which will work, some won't, some will work quicker than others at the, at the same time. And, and I just want to stress one thing. All of us are different. Human beings have different interests, passions, capacity, skill. Some people are good at reading and writing. Other people are awesome at digging holes and planting trees. We need a huge diversity of human activity. Everyone, you know, doing the thing that lights them up and makes them feel worthy and makes them feel that it's a good thing to do. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a patchwork quilt, a jigsaw puzzle. Everyone has a part to play. And that's where I get enthusiastic. The work we do, we're endlessly just a parade of amazing people doing really amazing stuff. So whoever's out there doing that, keep going. Um, if you're not doing it, just join something. There's tons of us out there. We need you. Come and volunteer. Ayla, Nina, Future Dreaming, Nagara Institute, something that Tim's doing. There's always something good to be done. But coming back to one of uh, the question here uh, put forth by Stephen Hawking, Tim, what do you think about the idea of citizen assemblies as promoted by Extinction Rebellion and other, other new democracy groups? Is this a way to reclaim democracy? Is this a way forward considering the political challenges that we also have? Well, I've been a bit busy in the chats, I have to say. So I've answered Stephen's question um, on that. But um, I mean, the problem I have is that we've got this ridiculous thing called the political party. Uh, so like, you got these people that are elected to represent us, but actually in order to represent us, they have to go into a particular set of factions that aggregate. And then when they get the numbers, they get elected. But in order to do that, they have to promise the faction that they're in, that's part of this bigger thing, blah, 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 blah. So we get to a point where the people are actually completely left out of the equation. Um, and we have elite capture, business always rules, rules, uh, rules the day. So I'm really not a believer in parliamentary democracy. I am a deep Democrat. I believe in democracy to the core of my being. And I'm a pacifist, but I would certainly lay, lie down in front of a tank that was trying to physically take it away from me. Um, but what we actually have to do as citizens is organize ourselves and bugger the bigger, the bigger infrastructure. You know, like there are always people in power. There are always people trying to take control. There are always greedy, nasty people who are probably slightly insane or a little bit mentally ill, who are able to manipulate certain aspects of the population or their own personality to um, get what it, whatever it is they want. Um, but if we organize and we have drive, discipline, and devotion, um, we will achieve our ends. I always say, if you want something to happen, visualize it, and in 10 years, it will happen. The only reason it will not happen is because you gave up. So um, I'm 
I'm optimistic on that level is that we can find a way forward, but we just have to stop thinking that these, these gray elites, you know, these old blokes that look a bit like me, um, are going to be able to do anything. They're not, they're old, they're finished, they're history. Like, you know, half the world is under 25 and they've got no voice in this debate whatsoever. So that's why the hero, one of the heroes in my novel is a 12 year old Balinese refugee. Um, you know, there are lots of people out there uh, with solutions. What has to happen, I think, is just that the old geezers just get out of the way or just die. <laughs> Can I, just, can I just say, though, mm -hmm. I agree with most of what Tim has said, except the idea that if you visualise something and work your ass off for 10 years, it'll happen. Climate change action should have happened. The amount of energy that good people put into it. But you, you cannot underestimate the power of very, very wealthy corporations in the misinformation. They've, they've infected entire countries with misinformation and a lack of interest or belief in... I mean... I, you know, you, you've, you've seen it. We were old enough to have seen a complete shift in Australian society challenging the role of science versus, you know, we were not like America 15 years ago. We didn't have people not believing in the basic powers of observation around us, et cetera, et cetera. So just before I'll finish, sometimes you need more than 10 years. I think- Well, I would, I, I would say that we're getting traction because we're winning. And these people are doubling down because they're losing. And I mean, I have to say, like, I have been going to cli the climate negotiations since, uh, since 2001 to uh, COP, Co Conference of the Parties uh, 6. Uh, and in COP 6, uh, we actually managed to convince the world, the world community that no, we did not want carbon credits to be based in planting trees because all the loggers would do is cut down forests to put plantations in, and we won. Um, and um, <laughs> sure enough, six months later, they had another cop in the same uh, year in order to get that thing uh, pushed back off the agenda again and put trees back in as the carbon credit solution to everything. Um, but I am amazed when I go to these international conferences to see there are 206 parties to that convention. I'm amazed that anything gets achieved at all. Um, and when you go in that space, I admit it's a policy silo, but it's a policy silo that has about 30,000 people there. Mm. Um, and stuff does get done. And we look at where we're at and we despair and we worry. Um, but I also go there I'm always like so schizophrenic when I'm there because I, one minute is, oh my God, this is terrible. You know, Brazil and America are, are lying with Australia and the coal industry to screw the whole thing over. And then I look later and I see all my NGO, um, you know, research subjects uh, organizing in the back corridors, all the indigenous people caucusing and um, waylaying the, uh, the secretary general or whatever and uh, reasserting the right of the citizens. So, um, look, we live in a dynamic world. None of us ever get our own way. Um, but I think if we just keep on pushing, I think we'll get there. Well, and the alternative is a bit depressing, isn't it? What do we do, give up and stay under the doona? I have doona days, but then I jump up and do something. Um, and well, I that's what a lot of people do. Yeah, you uh, have that's to. What, that's, but that makes me mad. Uh, yeah. Because I want people to do stuff because the yes. only way we'll solve this is to do stuff like you do, Michelle. You know, you do stuff. And I'm not saying some people are, some people are passive in life. I understand that. But they could still like, I don't know. Um, um, uh, they can donate be, to us and support our work, Tim. Donate to us or be a backroom person or, or, yeah. or, or help in whatever way they can. We just have to find a way to plug them into our system, not theirs. And the other thing I, oh, sorry, I, I actually, um, no, you go, you go, Jean. How would you suggest we handle, and she put in, in between inverted commas, bad actors in our systems, people who are exploiting situations for self-interest at the cost of the collective? And this is a profound question because we are here also talking about you no know, respect, about non-violence, about diversity. So it, it's a profound question, Fiona. Thank you for asking it. How do we suggest we handle those bad actors? I have, I have two answers. 
The first one is a bit silly, but if anyone has seen the first movie, um, Madagascar, where the animals are on the beach, a lion is depressed because he doesn't want to be there. The zebra entices him to come over. He says, come over to the fun side. The fun side's just not the same without you. The better answer is the Buckminster Fuller quote, you never change anything by fighting the existing system. You're something like you're better off creating something new and shifting things to it. At a personal level, when you're dealing with people who block you, there's a lot of different situations and ways to handle it. But at a structural point, there's definitely two mechanisms. One is build around it. The amount of energy you spend trying to address the blockers, you could actually be over here building something else with other people and invite them to the fun side. Um, that's not always possible, but that Buckminster Fuller quote is very much like a lot of our work is built on. We can't change the way the governments are working at the moment. What we do, what we can do. And the thing we can do is work with incredible, smart, positive people, show people a bit of leadership, a bit of fun, a bit of uh, collegiality, solidarity, and people will come together because most people are actually really good. And the small sector of folks who are, as Tim said, I agree, sociopaths who don't care about the living world or who are, if you apply compassion, who are so disconnected from reality, perhaps because they've been unfortunate enough to have been really wealthy and have never needed anyone, have never needed anything. Everything's been handed to them. These are people who often don't understand what it is to be supportive and productive. So the way we handle the blockers, the bad news bears, the people who are nasty, sometimes you deal with them front on and that's where, you know, activism, direct action, it's all awesome. Other times you've got you've got to keep moving around those barriers and keep creating this positive vision because I would suggest that to date some of that has been lacking in Australia. Some of that there's a huge potential to showcase and show off to each other the good stuff and bring more and more people into that so that you turn around and in a way that's what some of the market forces, the ethical investment, you know the turning away from investing in fossil fuels, that for all of my dislike of market economics has been to some extent a very powerful way to show capitalism. We don't like you anymore. If you're going to do fossil fuels, we're going to go over here now. And capitalism is a very clever beast and I don't really want it to continue, but it will shift quickly to follow where the money is. That's just one example. And it's not the best example, but I hope that that at least shares my view. So. Uh, one thing I might just say, um, Jean is a bit of a shout out to all the uh, denialist skeptics and bots who have been posting to the advertisement for this actual um, event tonight. I would really encourage um, all the participants to go in and look at the debate that's been raging back and forth between me and others and them um, and, and just see um, how uh, fundamentally weak um, the opposition really is because they don't actually know what they're talking about. Uh, so when you call them on the fact that climate and weather are different um, and you explain that one is a regional um, event that happens because of um, circumstances locally and one is a global cycle and they're not to be confused, um, you find out very quickly who, as Michelle has alluded already, is kind of pushing the agenda behind them and call it out, you know. Um, I think that's the best thing you can do is, is um, ch challenge these people uh, front on. Yeah, which is interesting. Sometimes, that... where, we're, Sometimes. Where, we're, where we're free and we have democracy. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of the um, uh, contributors tonight have already um, expressed great disquiet about where we are at with COVID-19 right now the decimation of our planning laws, et cetera, et cetera. We are in extremely troubling times mm. uh, from a democratic perspective. And, you know, my, my nice little bouquet to ScoMo notwithstanding, you know, I don't want anybody to think that um, we're in a good place. Of course we're not. But, you, you know, for me, I've been fighting since Matron bullied me in boarding school when I was seven, and I'm not going to give up. Uh, now and I, I just think we have to stay strong we have to organize uh, we have to try and be nice to each other uh, respectful where we can to the opposition and when we get stressed try not to shout too much i would probably add to this uh, excellent list also the necessity to build local resilience 
think of the ways we can transform our societies locally. Uh, and as Michelle mentioned before, build the future we actually want to live in. Andrew Buckwell has made a comment here about there are some easy ways to highlight a fake, fake Facebook profile in response to what Tim was saying. And then he says there are only 30 <laughs> people left on Facebook and I am five of them. <laughs> that kind of wraps up. Social media generally um, has, has a limited purpose. It can be wonderful. It can be, you know, help connectivity and it can be just a great big seething mess of crazy conspiracies. So like all things in human uh, societies, choose carefully, uh, use wisely and avoid <laughs> when possible. So. I'd like to thank you everyone. I think the question asked were really fascinating. There are a few more, but actually we can't really, don't, don't really have the time to get into these. Um, but uh, also a deep thank you to Michelle and team for taking time to share with us and respond so openly about these questions. I mean, I think if I, if I take any way, anything from this conversation time is really that, okay, we are in a really difficult, challenging time, but we also have a number of resources at hand within us and just around us that we can delve on in order to transform the way we live rapidly. As a cancer survivor, someone who spent many days through a long treatment, wondering if I would live through it, my big reminder to you is every morning, just breathe in and out and be so grateful for the time we have and uh, do something lovely with it. Because truly, we, we all live as if we're immortal. Mm, we've got a short time, so let's, let's just get in and enjoy it. it. There's so much that we're losing, but there's so much still here. You know, Let's try to be positive and let's breathe in and out and have a groovy time. <laughs> exactly. At a blockade. At a blockade. At a blockade. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Wherever you are, make the bloody most of it. <laughs> Our next event is scheduled for June 24, 24th, and we will be looking at the impacts of climate change on mental health with mm -hmm. Dr. Amy Maxwell from ACU and Dr. Dr. Fiona Charlson from UQ and University of Washington. So, another Fantastic. Yeah, promising conversation here. Um, Join us on Facebook and Twitter. Sign up to Nagara's newsletter and the website homepage, social media. Uh, if you find value in tonight's discussion, you know, uh, join us again next month and share the good news, really. Uh, finally, uh, I'd like also, for those of you who are located in Bayern Shire, you know, check out also the Resilient Bayern website. If this is something you would like us to do together, we can transform the way we live locally. So you're very welcome to, to join the crew. Tim, Michelle, Grateful Thank to you. Have today. Thank you so much. It's been really Thank a pleasure you. to you. Thank Good you. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Tim. Ciao. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. <laughs>